This is an um, interview with Sally Booth and his camera roll 311 17. Take one. Yeah, I forgot where I wanted to begin. <laughs> uh, let's talk. Actually, let's let's start with the story about people coming to the various doors of the house. We'll mm -hmm. probably come back to it later on. But why don't you just start telling me about uh, people coming to the front door and to the back door and the peanut butter sandwiches and just however you feel like doing. Uh, I I remember very much the the people and in my memory they were men. I don't remember any women doing this, but maybe there were some who would come to the door of our house down in Detroit and ring the doorbell and sell things like um, shoelaces and um, uh, simple things like, I mean, they, they couldn't have been chewing gum or whatever, but they were very modest things and for a very small amount of money. And I don't remember ever buying them, but I expect my mother certainly, I don't think she ever turned anyone away. And, but I do very well to remember dealing with the people who came to the back door and asked for food. And I remember making them peanut butter sandwiches. And, and I remember um, handing them to them. And they, they never came in, but they would sit on the back steps sometimes and eat their sandwiches or they would go away with them. And I never remember being afraid of them. They were always very unthreatening kind of people. And certainly, I remember my mother saying to me about them and about the people on the front porch, the people in the front who were selling things. Somehow, I was very uncomfortable with and very embarrassed and humiliated for them for some reason. And I remember mother always saying to me, Sally, these people are exactly like us. They just don't have any money, but they're people that are as, as worthy and as, as they're, they're people that are no different from you and me and your father. And so I was never afraid of them, but I was, I was uncomfortable for them because I thought how humiliating it would be for me to go and sell something. Somehow the people asking for food seemed a little less humiliating to me, and I guess I don't know why. I could I could mull that over if you want me to, Great. but <laughs> no, excellent, excellent. Um, let's as long as we're on that story, let's let's do it again. It's fine, we have it. Let's um, if, if you give me a little bit more abbreviated version of it, mm -hmm. front door to back door, um, and remind us at some the audience for this film will not hear my questions. Mm -hmm. uh, remind us at some point that you were a little child. Oh, that you were and how also, old I was. Um, yeah, just yeah. If you can remind us that, mm -hmm. that we're hearing the story from a little girl's point of view, uh, and also mm -hmm. feel free to gesture and move around, or whatever. <laughs> wave my hands. Well, wait, wait, well I, I th <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> that's that's allowed. <laughs> um, the people coming to the to the door to sell things and to ask for things. Um, it. Uh, we lived in a house in Detroit, and I must have been six, perhaps seven years old, and the people that came were selling shoestrings and pencils, and they always came to the front door. And other people came asking for food and came to the back door, as I remember, and I made them sandwiches, peanut butter sandwiches or whatever we had, and never was afraid of them. I don't ever remember being afraid of them uh, because Mother said to me, Sally, these are people exactly like us, and only they just don't have a job like your father has at the moment or a job like I have, because my mother was working. Um, and they were, um, I was allowed to make sandwiches. I know, don't remember anybody being there with me, but I was, it was a safe thing to do. I felt safe. So your mother, is it safe to say your mother made it clear that it was not these people's fault? That they... Absolutely. It was, it, she was very clear to me that these were people who, who in another circumstance, would be living just like us. It wasn't their fault that they were 
that they were poor like this. There were a lot of people that were poor. Poor wasn't, poor wasn't a bad thing. It was an unhappy, scary thing, but it didn't have anything. I never felt it had anything to do with these people. They didn't. They weren't poor because they were bad or stupid or evil. They were poor for some other reason that made it unhappy for them. Tell me exactly that, and but preface it by saying my, my mother, even I was a little girl, and my mother made it clear to me that. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. Okay? Yeah. That, um, I, was, I was very little. I was six or seven. Uh, but I, I never, ever remember feeling that these people were were poor because it was their fault. My mother made, made it very clear to me that, that something else was causing them to be poor and that other than that, they were exactly like us. Is that all right? Excellent. <laughs> well said. That's the reason we came to Detroit. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Um, let us know that your family was moderately, you know, your middle class family, well to do, to make it clear that you weren't on mm. relief, or, mm -hmm. but still there were there was constant worry about money. And even even your family was not immune. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we lived we lived in a in a in a house a, a single family house in Detroit, but we rented it. We rented it furnished. Uh, my father had. A, a job as a salesman, so I don't think he was making very much money, but at least he was working. My mother worked for the city uh, as a social worker and was paid in script. Uh, but because they both were working and because I had a, an infant brother and I was about maybe six or seven, we had a, a full-time housekeeper who, who lived with us. And I remember hearing someplace that she was paid five dollars a week, which I, I, don't, I, I don't know why I would come up with that, except it must, it must be a real memory. But she lived with us and ate with us and cooked for us and took care of my brother and me while my mother and father were working. And I never felt as if, I never felt poor. I never felt afraid um, that I would not have a house. I was very afraid of money because that kind of conversation went on all the time in my household. And that was the only thing that I ever worried about was my parents talking in worried, fearful, argumentative tones about money. But I, I always had food, and I, always, I had lots of friends, and I had a, a family that was with me. So I felt, I expect I was, we were a middle-class family. Great, great. Um, Can you cut bits out and put it together? And that's exactly what we do. We're going to good. take scissors and because pop this all That's good, because I, a, I a tend... from here and a word from there. I tend to go on. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Seriously, you're doing great. I would be stopping you right and left if you weren't. Uh, remembering that the audience will not hear my voice, did mm -hmm. you ever see President Hoover? Uh, I won... I, a memory that I absolutely have absolutely clear is seeing President Hoover driving down Woodward Avenue in an open car in a parade of some sort. I have no idea what the parade was about. I have no idea what he was doing there, but the reason I remember is because he was the president, and the president was so exciting. And you didn't see the president. I mean, there was no television, so I'd never... And there was this man looking to me larger than life with a big round head like a like a ball or a pumpkin or something. It was, it was really strange, but he seemed so big and so, and he was sitting in the back seat of this open car driving down Woodward Avenue. To your little girl mind, did he represent all that was good or all that was important? All no, he was like a movie star. He was like a movie star. He was, <laughs> I have no idea what he was, except being a president was a large and wonderful thing. Pol yeah. Politics were, were, were talked a lot in my house. Yeah. Uh, and and president, being president was wonderful. <laughs> Great. What about, uh, I don't know if I asked you this before, do you have any recollection of, did, did Henry Ford mean anything to you as a little girl? Was it something that was a... Henry Ford only meant to me the name on the back of automobiles. And we had automobiles, we had cars that were, that were Fords, I'm sure. Automobiles meant a, meant a lot in my family um, because my father cared about them a lot. And, and fixed them all the time and did things, you know, made, made them work. And, and automobiles were, were, were a super wonderful toy. And, and, a, and interestingly enough, we must have been 
we must have had more money than you know than I was <laughs> worried about because we always had a car. We always had an automobile. The cars were cheap. Cars were cheap, yeah. but but only one. I mean, we never had two. <laughs> um, how are you doing on footage? You got like a hundred feet. Yeah, we got uh, fifty feet. Okay. Um, I'm trying to re-evoke those memories of hearing about the Ford Hunger March and hearing about. Oh, I think that, that talking about the people that that came to our house that that were that were obviously poor people. Um, the other thing I remember is what I now realize was the Ford Hunger March. And I remember Mother saying how brave those men were to, to stand up against, apparently, Henry Ford. I didn't know who they were standing up against, but I thought of them as very brave men doing something very dangerous. And very um, and very important. It, it was they were doing it for uh, apparently a larger reason, which I didn't know what it was. But they seemed they seemed very um, what strong. Um, they, they were doing they were doing something with a mission, and I didn't know what the mission was, but I I, I knew they were to be respected. And say these words for me. It's a roll I know we're gonna keep rolling. I just need you to say and I. Continuing overlap of uh, previous roles, wild take, just one line. Knew they were to be respected. And say these words for me. It's a rollout. I know, we're going to keep rolling. I just need you to say, and I was only six years old. Oh, and I was, I was only six years old then. Okay, great. Let's cut for a moment. <laughs> that last line, I was only six years old, was on wild track. And um, we're going to change roles now. Okay, you can do it fine without any prompting. Oh, try and don't look up quite so much. Oh, yeah. that's where my end. <laughs> I'm. I'm. I think. Yeah. Um, okay, fairy tales. Anyway. Fairy tales. Yes, I. Uh, I think the reason that I that I felt the marchers were so brave was because I was very involved in fairy tales as a child, and they seemed. From what I from what I picked up from from mothers talking, they seemed to be doing something that was brave because they were so powerless. They had no. They were lose. They were in risk of losing everything, just like the the people in the fairy stories. And they were going out and doing it anyhow. And I had this sense that they were wonderful, brave people. And I think I also thought of them in terms of the people who came to the door, who seemed to me very powerless. And I thought they must be the same people. And they were, they were to be, they were to, to be, what? Um, um, I've lost the word. What do I want? Yeah. It's fine. That's, no, no. <laughs> um, let's, that's great. That's extraordinary. Let's. You want to cut for a second? And give your mag a whack there. Is that? Um, there was some camera sound in that, so we're going to do uh, was, yeah. booth take three. Try again. Just thinking about. Try again. Okay. Where do you want me to start with it? Um. Uh, why don't you start with just that you had heard about this thing that had happened? I had heard that. Do I call it the Hunger March? Because I wouldn't have known that no, it was. No, don't call it the Hunger March. Just uh, you can start right where you did. It was the. the oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. Um. With the, the wherever you started last time was great, and I can't. Remember I can't remember where it was either. It was uh, uh, the the people, the. I thought of the, them as. Uh, no, I don't know um, what I thought. A little kid. That I was a lot to keep seven or eight. Mind, I know. <laughs>
You're doing fine. You're doing just great. And we will yeah. slip and cut. Great. You're fine. You're doing just great. And we will yeah. slip and cut. Great. Speed. Speed? Okay. Okay. They, I, I thought of them as, as reminding me of the people in fairy tales who, who had nothing and, and who w did something incredibly brave in order to, what, win the kingdom or whatever. Uh, they seemed to me very much the same as the people who came to the door asking for food or selling things when I was, and I would give them as a five or six or eight-year-old child, I'd give them food or I'd, I'd see them selling shoelaces. They seemed brave and wonderful because they were so powerless, just like the people in fairy tales. <laughs> Any more? Fantastic. Well, let's not stop now. We're doing great. <laughs> uh, I've, um, I'm going to, that's great. We've, we've got that. I'm going to jump to enough? a couple of other unrelated questions. Um, I didn't ask you this before. Do you have any memory of Franklin Roosevelt's election or inauguration? Did that mean anything to you? Uh, yes, you? yes, because. <laughs> I remember the audience will not hear my voice. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I, I remember Franklin Roosevelt as being also larger than life in our family because my mother was very pro-Roosevelt and my father was very much against him. So we had wonderful dinner table conversations, uh, some of which were frightening to me because they were so full of emotion. But um, uh, this was a man who, because I think I identified more with my mother, who I thought of as, as, a, as a real savior who was going to take care of all these people who, who I felt so sorry for because they were, they were, the, they were the, the, the powerless and the people that were left out and the, the, the lost children. I mean, I was fairly, fairly dramatic when I was six and seven and eight. And, uh, but Franklin Roosevelt was going to take care of them. He was going to be, he was going to make everything be all right. He was going to comfort them and feed them and give them, give them houses and, and it was going to be all right. Because it was a scary time then for lots of reasons. Childhood is scary and when you're growing up in the middle of, of anxiety with, the adults were anxious and you didn't really know why, it was a scary time. Very well said. Very well said. It's a great leap of, of uh, thought. Uh, in your family, did people listen to, uh, I'm going to talk about Joe Lewis, just a brief mm, couple mm -hmm. of sentences. Did, Joe, did, did people listen to Joe Lewis's fights? People listened to Joe Lewis on the radio. Of course, we never saw him. Uh, but we listened to him on the radio, and we're aware, of course, that he was black because this was one of the first people who were black who, who did something that exciting and I think that the but the main reason that we thought he was that we listened to him was because he was wonderful it wasn't because he was black and it wasn't even because he was a fighter but he was another he was a, a he was a hero larger than life just like Roosevelt and just like just like you know the president and and just like movie stars we didn't have all that many people like that and Joe Lewis was wonderful and he was ours he was Detroit's <laughs> Great, great. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Steph owes me a beer. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> this is for another film in the series that another, oh. another director is doing. And he asked me to ask all of our people about seeing Joe Lewis's oh. Great. Um, I think this is my last question. Um, you said that your mom brought home songs from mm -hmm. the Depression. Are mm -hmm. you a singer? Do you remember songs? Do you... I don't. I'm not a singer, but I remember. I remember the songs that she brought home, and we played on the record player on the Victrola. Uh, they were they were union songs. They were songs from. Um, uh, help me with his name. Woody um, Guthrie. Woody Guthrie and and. Uh, uh, oh, and they were Woody Guthrie, and they were the ones about the the union maid who never was afraid of goons and ginks and company finks and the deputy sheriff who made the raid, and. Uh, uh, we used to play, they were wonderful songs to sing, and they were, they, I think, also reinforced my feeling that these, that these men that were doing whatever the scary things like the marching and the being on the bridge and all the things that, that I vaguely heard about, I thought of them as, as, as brave, exciting men who were doing something good for all of us. Um, I don't know why, but they were, you know, they were out there challenging the, the, the king. 
maybe. <laughs> Just like in the fairy tales. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Somebody give you a script. Talking about um, next is uh, Sally Sally Booth. Take. Next is Sally Booth. Take four. simply tell us that um i know that the that was a terribly desperate worrying time for everybody and i think the only thing i remember ever worrying about was my parents worrying about money they talked about it when i was in bed and they would they would be you know loud upsetting discussions and that scared me but i never was worried that anything would happen to us as a family that that i i knew we'd be all right because it didn't occur to me that we wouldn't. They were strong people, and they, whatever they were concerned about, um, they, I, I never felt that anything would hurt me. Okay, great. And cut. Next is room tone for Sally Booth interview. Next is room tone for Sally Booth interview. Hold still for 30 seconds, I'm sorry. No, 10 seconds if it was up to me.
8, take 3. Okay, now we're all warmed up. Tell me about visiting the Rouge Assembly Line. Uh, when, when I was a little girl in grade school, when I was in second or third or fourth grade in grade school in Detroit, one of the trips that we always took was to the Rouge plant, to the assembly line in the Rouge plant uh, and the Ford plant. And we would walk on a catwalk, some kind of a catwalk, over the assembly line so that we looked down on the workers that were, that were working. And um, we could see them uh, doing, as the cars passed along, they would be, each one would be doing something and they would do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And, and, uh, uh, and that was, that was apparently the point of the assembly line. But, uh, the thing that I remember the most was the blast furnaces, which were d great big dark furnaces and with men standing in front of them and, and they'd open the doors and the, the fire would shoot out and it would be, it would be this bright, molten-looking fire, and the sparks would fly, and the heat would come up. We could feel the heat over the cat as we were walking along over that. It, it would be terribly, terribly hot. And and we always felt sorry for them in the summertime because we thought, how could they stand it in the summertime? They'd still have to do it no matter what. More? Great. I, I mean, what what more? Great. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, let's keep going. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Out-of-town visitors. Oh, and... Because because this was such a, a a special thing for Detroit, whenever anybody came to visit us from out of town, why they would always want to see the assembly line, and so we would go and and I guess they must have had tours that because we could always go and take people uh, to visit the assembly line, and this was a this was only happened in Detroit. It was a typical Detroit thing, and so we were uh, we were very proud to show it off because it was special for us. <laughs> Great. Let me remind you, you can look anywhere, but don't look, don't look right into the lens. Oh. Okay? It'll steal your soul. <laughs> uh, it's fine to repeat, by the way. You can do stuff over okay, and over and over again. Okay, because it'll pick it in and out. Tell me the story again, and let's, uh, as long or as short as you feel like, and let's try to talk about uh, fairy tales in hell a little bit. Mm, mm. The, uh... I probably remember the the um, blast furnaces the most because it was so dramatic and it was um, it it meant more to me perhaps than just the people doing their their repetitive job because I grew up on fairy tales and I I predicated every I everything through fairy tales I I I understood everything via fairy tales I think and it seemed like um, dungeons. Hell, I don't know all the. Th I don't know what at seven I thought of, but uh, it was a very dramatic thing to see, and and scary and exciting, and um, and I felt very sorry for the for these chaps who had to do it all day long. Even though it may have been, it was also exciting. It it must have been. It it seemed very scary too to me. Hard work. Excellent. Uh... Marionettes. Oh, the the assembly line workers. Uh, as I say, they did the same thing over and over and over again. And to see it from on top, looking down, was a sort of a strange feeling because, in a way, they they weren't. They looked more like like automatons or marionettes than real people, and yet we knew they were people. But they would the, even their arm motions would be exactly the same over and over. It was like, it really was like a human machine. I think that's what it seemed like to us. In fact, I guess that's what it was. <laughs> Fantastic! Great. We've just been editing a sequence that really is about that that whole idea. Uh, human yeah. machine. Yeah. Let's cut for a second. Um, again, it's okay for you to repeat. Okay. Remember, people will not hear my voice. Mm -hmm. um, can you uh, in, tell me whatever, as much of the story as you like, but incorporate once again that you were seven years old, say, and can you also t talk about the notion of the king's kingdom in you? Uh, I, I'm not sure that that 
fits in here except in terms of the fairy tale. Uh, um, I, I thought... Or a magic kingdom. The magic. Well, no, it was. It wasn't that so much. I. I think I remembered the concept of the of the, of the king in in terms of the of the poor beggars that came around. Right. Uh, I mean, that certainly fits in with the fairy right. tales with the with the poor beggars who come to the door and and who are, you know, who knows princes in disguise. But certainly because my mother said to me always, uh, these are people just like us. So that certainly is somebody in disguise, and 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 having to do something as humiliating and kind of um, as begging was a hard thing. And I always, I, I, and so they were um, what servants of the king, in effect, like like maybe the people on the assembly line were too. It was like the, you know, I could put anything <laughs> in in terms of a fairy tale, but but it 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 did seem like there was a man who was very powerful and he was he owned all these people he was in charge of them all airplane yeah second. is it going is it going it's going over let's just keep rolling it's interesting how every bit of sound matters so much yeah i'm going to have you start with it seemed as though there was a man oh the the said. the it it it, it I probably, you know, sort of figured it in terms of there. There was a, uh, there was a powerful man in charge of all these, of of all these things of these of these peoples on the assembly line, who he could he could wind up and make do all these things and 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 who uh, um, had uh, who all the who who. Had something to do with the poverty, with people being poor and and being uh, not. How do I think about it? Um, it had to do with not their own masters. Well, kind of no, I'm trying to think how that would be. They they were, they were poor, and and they. Well, it doesn't really connect as much as it did before. Let's come back to that. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's tr let's uh, once again do the the assembly line. Assembly line, and let me throw out this idea of black and red. Oh, yeah. In the, kitchen. the colors. Yeah. Um, I I I don't remember so much the light on the assembly line. We could see the people very well, and the the the, the furnace doors opening being so bright were. Um, was a great contrast because it looked like it was very dark and very black and then the doors would open and this red gold thing would burst out that would be fire and then they'd do something and they'd close the doors and they'd close it all off again and it was a very highly dramatic thing in terms of those those colors I remember I don't know what color the the assembly line didn't seem to have any color to me that I can remember but the but the furnace did the furnace did uh, great great um, I'm going to have you say once again just this uh, in little introductory sentence to make sure we have it. Uh, that I was a little girl. That you were a little girl, yeah, and that one of the things that you did was school field trips to the mm -hmm. Gators, just as mm -hmm. one or two sentences. Mm -hmm. When this plane to go. Oh, I didn't realize we were on such a path. <laughs> you never realized till you're filming. Yeah. yeah. They're low too because of the weather. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I was a little girl in Detroit in grade school in second and third and fourth grade in the early 30s, we went always, every year I think, to uh, a field trip to the Rouge plant to the assembly line because this was something that was special for Detroit and nobody else had it and it was a new and wonderful thing and this was the only way we could get to see it. So we'd, we'd go, we'd be taken by our teachers and we'd go uh, to the Rouge plant in Highland Park and and walk over the assembly line on a catwalk, on a on a catwalk up in the up in the air. We'd climb up and look down on the assembly line, and and there would be these people doing doing making cars, and each one would do one thing and one thing and one thing and one thing over and over and over again, moving their arms in the same way, and and 
uh, as, as the car moved along the line, each person would do one special thing to it. And at one point, I, I, at some place along the line, there was this, there were steel furnaces making, blast furnaces making steel. And as we walked over those, we could feel the terrible heat coming up from them. And they'd open the doors and the fire would blaze out in this black darkness down below and this gold, bright red gold fire would blaze out and they'd do something and poke it with great big long things with handles and the doors would shut and the fire would stop again and it would be black and we could see these figures down below moving around the, the blast furnaces and then they'd open the door and then they'd sort of all stand out of the way. It was very dramatic and very exciting and that part I remember the most about it and because we felt sorry for these men that were in this terrible, terrible heat down below. Uh, and in the summertime, we thought, what did they do in the summertime? How could they? And it was like, it was like, <laughs> to use one of my fairy tales analogies again, it was almost like the dwarfs down in the caverns under the, under the mountain, working for for the for the king who made them make gold. And I, I <laughs> maybe that's too. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Yeah.